Hi, my name is Greg Murray. I'm really looking forward to the Mood and Neuroscience Conference in North Carolina. For this electronic part of my talk, I'll be using PowerPoint just with overlaid audio. And I thought that's not ideal, just having a disembodied voice. So I thought, let's start with a selfie. So this is me. This is our lounge room. And I look forward to meeting you in person in North Carolina in early November. So, of course, the great thing about being a bipolar disorder researcher is one's presentation slides get to have lovely images in them because of the association between bipolar disorder and creativity. Uh, so this painting, Café Terrace at Night by Van Gogh, painted in 1888, captures Van Gogh's fascination with the hours between dusk and dawn and in, in fact, he thought a lot about twilight and night he, he, throughout his whole career. And many paintings show his he, fascination with subtle shifts in light across the 24 hours, uh, the, across the 24 hour day, which of course links nicely to today, today's talk on bio, biological rhythm involvement in bipolar disorder. The bulk of today's talk will focus on our in investigations into three pathways for which we have evidence of involvement in bipolar disorder. Firstly, robustness of circadian oscillation. Secondly, interactions between circadian and reward function. And finally, complex system properties related to circadian function. That third pathway opens up some really quite different types of question about the involvement of circadian function in, uh, in bipolar disorder. We'll finish up with a little summary which then acts as discussion points which I will look forward to pursuing with you in depth uh, when we meet in North Carolina. So for those of you who aren't so familiar, uh, bipolar disorder as defined in DSM-5 is a lifelong recurrent mood disorder associated with significant uh, what, what the consumers call misery stats, which I won't go into now, but it's also associated with unusual strengths, which are that's highly valued by people with the diagnosis. And these strengths aren't just uh, subjective impressions. There is data linking bipolar disorder to things like creativity and academic ability. Those links, of course, aren't absolute to give you a sense of the, the magnitude uh, we find prevalence estimates uh, of bipolar disorder to be up around 8 to 10 percent in samples of eminent artists compared to the population prevalence of 1 or 2 percent. In terms of academic ability, a study done in Sweden where they're so well organised they can link education data to health data found that kids in upper primary school who were getting grades of A's and B's were four times as likely in adulthood to warrant a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Another important feature of the disorder for today's talk, when we're, we're going to be focusing primarily on categorical bipolar disorder, but we've also done quite a bit of work on to, into sort of deconstructing that construct. So I wanted to acknowledge that we, we do try and think dimensionally as well because uh, like probably most mental disorders, what we currently call bipolar disorder has fuzzy boundaries with other disorders and with normality. Thinking dimensionally about bipolar disorder, it, it really looks like, and, and Eric Youngstrom and I have worked together on, on, on this topic, it really looks like two dimensions are important to capture when we're thinking dimensionally about bipolar disorder, depression proneness and mania proneness. And the other descriptive feature of bipolar disorder that's really relevant to today's talk is the notion of activation. Uh, when Krapelin described mood disorders a hundred years ago or so, he talked about core shared the dimensions of mood, cognition and motor activity and he did not prioritise mood. DSM has 
always prioritised mood in the diagnosis of bipolar disorder until DSM-5, when activation has been lifted up to being a criterion A symptom, a necessary symptom, alongside mood. And this is, we think this is a, a very important development um, uh, because it really focuses us onto behaviour in the environment. Uh, and you'll see why that's important to us in a second. So let's start thinking about uh, bipolar disorder and the role of biological rhythms broadly. By biological rhythms, I'm referring to sleep, wake and circadian rhythms. And where necessary, I'll distinguish between them. What we see in this graph here, and I'm sorry, my pointer is not working. So describing graphs is a bit of a pain uh, at the moment. Uh, what you see in this graph on the y-axis is days. There's 14 days captured here. Blue is the sleep state as uh, estimated by an algorithm built into the actigraphy hardware. And on the, did I say y-axis then? I meant y-axis. And then on the x-axis is time of day. Going from left to right, we go from midnight through to midnight with midday as the midpoint of the x-axis on this graph. The data here is of a young man with bipolar 1 disorder, community dwelling, in a study where we were investigating the ability of actigraph data to predict mood changes in bipolar disorder. Uh, people were euthymic when enrolled into the study. And across these 14 days, I just want to bring your attention to what happens to this young man's sleep-wake cycle. Uh, you can see, let's just look at day one, which is the upper panel of this, this graph, where he slept from about 1am to about 11am. So a fairly typical young adult sleep cycle, actually. Uh, yeah, fairly archetypal, actually. And, and then he's going down for the next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight days, having uh, a sleep cycle of about that duration and about that phase, but then we see a couple of days of what turns out to be a 48-hour sleep-wake cycle with uh, three days, with no, three 24-hour periods, I'm sorry, with no sleep in them at all. And what happened at the end of the last day here, where he has that short sleep cycle, which goes from 6.30 in the morning through to about 10.30 in the morning, is he was picked up on the streets of Bendigo, the small town in Australia where he lives, floridly manic and sectioned into um, an inpatient stay for treatment of his mania. We're very interested in actigraphy, and actigraphy becomes a sort of uh, methodological theme through today's talk. It provides high-resolution time series data non-intrusively for extended periods of time. In this particular study, we had participants with bipolar disorder giving us actigraphy data for up to 12 months, and it caused them absolutely no concern whatsoever, whereas they found daily reporting of mood to be uh, very uh, tedious. And not surprisingly, actigraphy is now gaining more attention as kind of an early form of wearable device from which we can generate big data. It's an early form which we understand well because the conventions around scoring and analysing have been you know, uh, uh, in place for a long time through its role in sleep research primarily. Uh, and so a number of people are starting to investigate uh, the possibility that changes in sign various signals that we get from actigraphy data might function as automated early warning signs for relapse in bipolar disorder. And in fact, Kathleen Merikangas and others have formed uh, a working group focusing particularly on activation and focusing primarily on actigraphy as the method of measuring it. So let's start to think about these uh, biological rhythm hypotheses of bipolar disorder. They've been around for a long time, ever since uh, Tom Weir uh, introduced the notion of sleep or disturbed sleep as a final common pathway to mania. But interestingly, already, even though I'm, I'm arguing today that there's still a lot that we don't know, uh, clinicians are very familiar with this because in just about all the treatment guidelines worldwide, 
stabilizing 24-hour behavioral rhythms is core to the uh, behavioral component of managing bipolar disorder. So what makes us think that circadian and sleep-wake processes are causally involved in BD? Alison Harvey and I reviewed this literature in 2010 and there's since been a, a number of other reviews but even at that time there were a, a very very large number of studies that we could draw from and we broke those studies into three types. There were studies that uh, just spoke to associations between biological rhythm function and uh, bipolar disorder phenomena. There were studies that spoke to shared underlying substrates for the two uh, 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 phenomena, so biological rhythm phenomena and bipolar disorder. And then there were studies that were of most interest to us, which threw some light on the possible causal role of circadian uh, sleep function and bipolar disorder. So the types of studies that we're talking about there, firstly, uh, things that show changes in sleep that are associated with uh, the different phases of bipolar disorder, mania where we see both decreased need for sleep and insomnia, depression where we see significant sleep changes and as Alison Harvey and her group have shown, uh, very significant sleep disturbances inter-episode and great distress around those sleep disturbances. So that's uh, some correlational stuff associating biological rhythms with bipolar disorder. Naturalistically, there's some evidence that uh, changes in uh, factors that are relevant to biological rhythms may induce bipolar disorder uh, type uh, phenomena. So for example, we're thinking there about seasonal changes, uh, time zone travel, shift work, uh, Ramadan, each of those environmental things for which we would, would, we would have reason for thinking they might be impacting biological rhythm function all increase vulnerability to relapse. But the strongest data linking uh, circadian sleep processes to bipolar disorder are experimental investigations of treatments and the treatment effects that we see. So, for example, uh, we know that light therapy and sleep restriction can induce mania. And we know from animal research that lithium, the most commonly used mood stabilizer, affects circadian rhythms through the GSK3 beta signaling pathway. Well, and GSK3, B, GSK3 beta is a central regulator of the circadian clock and valproic acid may act through the same intracellular signaling pathway. So we have preliminary reasons for thinking uh, there is a, a causal relationship, not just a, a correlational or an association relationship between circadian sleep processes and bipolar disorder. As I say, the, the main theme of today's talk is we have limited understanding of the mechanisms involved in this. And just to say one thing about that, uh, we wouldn't want to assume at all that today's talk is about uh, a, a biological rhythm, uh, etiological processes in isolation. We will be talking about the interaction between circadian function and dopamine function or, or reward function, but there is a, a very strong evidence that we should also be pursuing interactions between circadian function and, for example, serotonergic function as part of a pathway towards uh, bipolar disorder. Before we launch into the details of these uh, pathways, it's useful just to quickly recap the circadian system, and we're going to start with its functional significance. Uh, the Earth's environment is dramatically rhythmic, uh, and by rhythm there I'm referring to changes between light and dark. Just think about the difference between driving through any major city at 3 p.m. and driving through it at 3 a.m. The, the differences are dramatic. And even before there were cities, evolution noticed this. The change from light to dark and from dark to light is so such a fundamental feature of life on this particular planet 
that evolution has adapted what is known as predictive homeostasis to deal with it. And the system that manages predictive homeostasis in humans, mammals and other organisms is called the circadian system, which is phylogenetically older and more ubiquitous than sleep. For this talk, I'd like you to think about, and this is a simplification, that sleep is one of the uh, behavioural processes moderated by the circadian system. We'll think of sleep as sitting on top of circadian function. So uh, there's three things to say about the circadian system. One is it's a truly endogenous clock and it has two primary functions. One is to optimise engagement with the environment, make sure the organism is uh, most likely to achieve its goals of reward and, and unlikely to suffer from the, the threats the environment proposes. So it's management of that engagement with the environment, optimal, optimal management. But it also plays another role within the organism of coordinating timing between uh, numerous physiological processes. So that's point one. We know a lot about it. Uh, it has the master oscillator, there are oscillators throughout the body, but the master oscillator is located in the anterior hypothalamus in a very small group of cells called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We'll call that SCN in today's talk. And we know how the SCN generates a 24-hour rhythm. At the molecular level, there are intrinsically rhythmic cells in the SCN, and they generate an autoregulatory transcription translation feedback loop. And the time constants within which this operates generate a rhythm of approximately 24 hours. Then, nonlinear interactions between these SCN cells operating as a network generate a coordinated 24 hour rhythm. So, we know a lot about it because the uh, nature has been operating on a if it's not broke, don't fix it principle with regards to the circadian system. So we can learn a lot about the human circadian system from flies. So uh, uh, we, our knowledge advances very quickly given that uh, set of circumstances. But now the second feature of the circadian system, it's open. From what I've said so far, it would be reasonable to conclude that the circadian system could be fully closed, right? If we're just trying to predict the timing of an event on a given day like sunrise, why not just have a clock that ticks away at 24 hours and goes beep at 6 a.m. when you know it's an hour before sunrise and the organism needs to start to get ready for it. What we've forgotten there is time of sunrise changes across the seasonal year, of course. So the system is uh, best designed to be open to these seasonally shifting time cues and in fact even though the clock is a genuine endogenous clock it is synchronized daily to the timing of light and dark primarily through light itself but there are other time cues in the environment we call these time cues zeitgebers but the primary one in uh, all organisms is light so it has this fundamentally open flavor and the third feature, which is very interesting, uh, which we'll just briefly mention, is it's a very loopy system. It's a complex biological systems and it, a system, and in many ways it's a, an archetypal bi biological system because it's smart. So it's not going to just have one linear pathway with inputs and outputs. Uh, we've already described how it takes input to resynchronize or uh, a, a dynamic oscillatory process. But it also takes feedback from inside the organism. So, for example, one of the primary output targets of the SCN is the pineal gland, which uh, generates a nightly secretion of melatonin. But melatonin in the bloodstream itself feeds back on the operation of the circadian clock, of the core clock, uh, through targets of the MT1 and MT2 receptors, which in turn adjusts the clock resetting to dawn and dusk. So we see an adaptive sort of uh, resilience built into the system through that feedback process. But then the potentially most important and interesting feedback loop here is behaviour itself. 
And again, if I had a pointer, I'd be showing you to that arrow before, to the left of the eye. Uh, humans, of course, can change their circadian function because the system is open to light and light comes in through the eyes, through uh, uh, non-visual photoreceptors in the eyes. And humans can choose to, for example, close their eyes or choose to expose themselves to light at particular times of day or block their exposure to light at particular times of day, therefore changing circadian function. Uh, I know Eric Youngstrom's group, for example, is very interested in amber glasses, which block a frequency of light that the SCN is very interested in, uh, blue spectrum light, uh, with hypothesized beneficial impacts on both sleep and mood. So this fundamental feature of the circadian system that it is open and open to feedback by some of the system, uh, processes that it impacts uh, is what generates its clinical significance. So let's talk about these three circadian pathways. The first is robustness of os oscillation. Uh, think about robustness this way. Uh, robustness is to biology what resilience is to psychiatry. We're talking about a healthy balance between elasticity and rigidity in the context of a dynamic and changing environment. And robustness in the circadian context can be operationalized in the amplitude of the output rhythm. I personally, this is actually the point where I got interested in circadian research. My, my first career was as a drummer. Uh, and so when my lecturer in, uh, in a master's program started to speak to me about the circadian system, the one message I took away from that was that nature agreed with me that the uh, timekeeper is the most important part of any organisation. So I got very excited about this and started to think about what that means for mood and well-being. And our first study on this was uh, during my PhD, at the start of my second career, where we started to look at the possibility that risk for mood disorder was associated with decreased robustness or decreased amplitude of circadian oscillation as measured in core body temperature under constant routine conditions. As an aside, there is a whole science to the challenge of unmasking the circadian system and quantifying its behaviour. I won't be talking about that today and would love to talk about those challenges with you when we meet in early November. This study was one where we uh, took a bunch of healthy young adults and put them into two groups based on their neuroticism scores using uh, self-reported neuroticism as our measure of vulnerability to mood disorder and found, as expected, attenuated amplitudes in the group uh, scoring high on neuroticism, consistent with the idea of decreased robustness of the circadian system is a vulnerability to mood disorder. A decade or so later, my PhD student, Ben Bullock, uh, did a, used similar uh, logic to focus specifically on vulnerability to bipolar disorder. The independent variable here, vulnerability to bipolar disorder, was measured in two ways. Uh, firstly, he measured, uh, again, in uh, healthy young adults, he measured vulnerability to BD on Depew's General Behaviour Inventory, the GBI, uh, splitting groups, people into high versus low scorers. And secondly, to uh, enhance the precision of his measure of vulnerability, he also asked people about a prior history of major depressive episode. And the, that so, thus created a sort of two by two independent variable, high versus low GBI, crossed with presence versus absence of past major depressive episode. Not surprisingly, one of the cells was empty People who scored low on the GBI, none of them reported a past major depressive episode. So we ended up with three groups. Again, if I had a pointer, but you can't always get what you want, as Mick Jagger says. On the left, on the graph, on the, so the graph on the right, the left-hand group is the high-risk group. They're people who score high on the GBI and have a past history of major depressive episode. They have the lowest 24-hour activity amplitude. The next group, 
have high GBI scores and no history of major depressive episode, they're intermediate in their activity uh, amplitude. And the low risk group, it's called low on the GBI, and none of them had past history of major depressive episode, have the highest 24 hour activity amplitude. Again, consistent with this idea that biological rhythm robustness might be part of the vulnerability to disorder. Now, this idea, as I say, we, you know, we're just ex exploring it, but it actually we know about it through the social Zeitgeber hypothesis of bipolar disorder, which effectively states that some sort of exogenous scaffolding through uh, stabilising social rhythms uh, helps with a weak SCN signal and is therefore therapeutic in BD. That is the social Zeitgeber hypothesis. The work that Ben and I have undertaken is really digging down into what we mean by a weak SCN signal. The social Zeitgeber hypothesis is about the exogenous scaffolding. The second uh, pathway that I want to talk about is this interaction between uh, circadian stability and reward sensitivity. Lauren Alloy and her colleagues last year in Annual Review of Clinical Psychology published a, a paper which is not only a very comprehensive review of all relevant studies on that interplay between circadian function and reward sensitivity, but also proposes an innovative integrated model of bipolar disorder integrating both those uh, previously separate diatheses, circadian and reward. Uh, our group has been particularly interested in one possible uh, type of interaction between circadian function and reward sensitivity. It's the, the notion of a normative circadian reward rhythm that is potentially disturbed in bipolar disorder. The notion of a normative circadian reward rhythm has been around for a long time because David Watson of Panis fame, one of his early empirical studies using the Panis, uh, investigated diurnal rhythms in positive affect. Uh, in the context of circadian research, the word diurnal, meaning across the day, means a pattern that we observe across the day for which the endogeneity is unknown. So we might see a, a daily pattern in positive affect, which could be entirely due to exogenous factors, right? Availability of socialization, temperature in the environment, whatever. Uh, and so when I use the word diurnal in, th in this talk, it means there's a rhythm there. It may or may not have a circadian underpinning. So David Watson and others uh, demonstrated a, di a, di a diurnal rhythm in self-reported positive affect. And self-reported positive affect is uh, often understood as indexing reward activation. So this is only a short step away from a hypothesis that there is a normative circadian rhythm in reward activation, which is something we've been interested in for a long time. We confirm the existence of a circadian reward rhythm using self-reported positive affect as our measure of, uh, of reward activation uh, and published that in 2009 in a, a mixed-method study. There is, in fact, no single design this, that will do this for you. So we did three studies, one replicating uh, the work of Watson and others showing under naturalistic conditions a diurnal rhythm of positive affect explaining... Uh, where the diurnal rhythm explains some 13% of the variance in positive affect. Then we did a constant routine study that showed positive affect in the lab correlates with the, uh, the gold standard measure of circadian function, the core body temperature rhythm under those conditions. And then perhaps most convincingly, we did what's called a forced desynchrony, where you force people to live on a non 24 hour cycle. In this case, we used a 28 hour cycle. And the question then becomes whether self reported positive affect tracks that enforced 28 hour cycle or stays synchronized to the 24 hour rhythm in core body temperature, which can't adjust to that 28 hour uh, span. And we did find, as predicted, that the, uh, the self reported positive affect continued to track the circadian 24-hour rhythm in core body temperature, which enabled us to conclu conclude we found this circadian rhythm.
in uh, positive affect, which we have always interpreted as speaking about reward, not just self-reported mood. We have always been curious about what this would look like at the level of the brain. And we've just completed a pilot study about this, which is really interesting. So I'm briefly going to share the findings with you, and I'd love to talk about it further. So we got a bunch of healthy young adults and hypothesized that we would find in an fMRI study a diurnal rhythm in bold signal activation in the ventral striatum and the medial or and or the medial prefrontal cortex in the mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway. And we predicted that that diurnal rhythm would follow the same pattern as the rhythm we've seen under naturalistic conditions and in the lab in self-reported positive affect. That is, we predicted an inverted U-curve across the day with uh, activation in the uh, brain's reward pathways most prominent in the early afternoon compared to earlier in the morning and in the evening, so an inverted U. In the, FMRI, in the data I'm going to present to you, this is a task-based fMRI. So we're presenting people with a gambling task, which is known to uh, activate uh, reward centers of the brain. So what did we find? We were firstly happy. We found uh, a diurnal rhythm where uh, we did see a, a daily rhythm in activation in the ventral striatum, in, in particular in the left pudumen, uh, with a uh, peak voxel level of uh, P is less than 01 here for display purposes, but in fact statistically we found a, a cluster surviving voxel level thresholding of P is less than 0 0.001, so this is a fairly uh, robust finding of a diurnal rhythm in the reward centres but it went the wrong way. So that on that right-hand uh, figure, the second half down the bottom, you see three boxes. The box on the left is 10 a.m., the box in the middle is 2 p.m., and the box on the right is 7 p.m. So this is a U-shaped curve, not the inverted U that we would have expected to see based on self-reported positive affect. This was disappointing. So I did what any... Uh, uh, right-minded researcher would do, I ran hard for a post hoc explanation. I ran hard but didn't have to run far because I bumped into something that I probably would have known if I was a genuine neuroscientist, that the ventral striatum actually activates to unexpected reward. And so my post hoc explanation of what's going on here goes something like this. The ventral striatum says when you present it with a gambling task at 10 a.m. Whoa, cool, rewards. And when you present the ventral striatum with a gambling task at 7 p.m., it says, whoa, unreal, rewards, unexpected. But when you present a gambling task to the ventral striatum at 2 p.m., it says, eh, rewards. So I'd love to talk to you further about this uh, prediction error interpretation of the pattern of findings we've got here. Let's just take a step to summarise. Um, I know we just did that diversion into the brain, but let's focus primarily for the moment on this self-reported positive affect because it uh, turns into a nice story. We have this uh, plausible pathway by which circadian and reward systems may interact, this normative pathway, which involves a signal from the SCN reaching the mesolimbic dopaminergic system through a relay in the PVN and up into the prefrontal cortex where we imagine uh, uh, conscious awareness of positive mood is uh, generated. And I think this is kind of a nice observation because it's kind of a counterpoint to the more common top-down explanations of emotion regulation that we're familiar with and reminds us that uh, as theorists like Panksepp and other organismic and evolutionary theorists assume that higher functions emerge out of lower functions. And uh, we've got here a nice uh, concrete representation of what that might be referring to. But remember that this is a normative interaction between circadian and reward function, and I'm not presenting any evidence here at all that 
Bipolar disorder involves a disturbance in this normative circadian reward rhythm. That's what we think might be going on, but we don't know. If we turn to animal research, we do find uh, some grounds for thinking this is plausible. So in animal research, we do see circadian moderation of, a, of normative engagement with the, the rewarding environment. So, for example, in uh, mice, we see that uh, reward sensitivity is moderated by clock gene expression in mesolimbic dopaminergic pathways. But, uh, and in rats, we also see that reward learning is uh, dependent on Zeitgeber time. So, so le learned associations are moderated by the time at which they're learned, the circadian time at which they're learned. And we know from Colleen McClung's work that when we disturb circadian function in mice, uh, as in clock mutant mice, for example, we can generate mouse models of mania where we see increased cocaine sensitivity, hyperhedonic behaviour, which interestingly is moderated by lithium. So we do see in animal research both a normative circadian reward rhythm and its potential disturbance into uh, models of mania. So we think that potentially our interest in a, a normative circadian re reward rhythm may generalise to pathological emotion regulation in bipolar disorder, though we have no specific data on it. This is the kind of the last stage of the talk where we, uh, I, I'm going to get all non-Newtonian on you. So let's go back to this for a second. When we had this article published in uh, Emotion, I was excited about one particular feature of it, and I wrote this in the in the discussion. You know, the discussion's the point where you're really trying to sell the article, convince the reviewers of the last little bit of value. I said, terms like inspired and proud are elements of positive affect. It's striking that such complex phenomenology is moderated by a primitive sunrise forecasting system. And I thought, it's bloody poetic in my mind. And it was a couple of years later that I realised Damasio had said the same thing. It is intriguing to find the shadow of our evolutionary past at the most distinctively human level of mental function. He actually said it quite a bit earlier than me, which may explain my lack of success in national competitive grants, but that's a story for another day. Um, so, But it is interesting, right, that we've got this complex system with the, these, these uh, hard-to-fathom connections between um, mechanical processes and, and, and tangible processes in the brain, that grey-wet thing, and subjective experiences that we can language. And so I started to explore what this might mean. You know, what do we do with that? And there, I discovered, or in collaboration with lots of other people, we discovered there's kind of two things you can do with that. You can do theory with it, and you can do nonlinear dynamic analysis. So when it comes to theory, there, there actually are ways of thinking about this complex relationship between brain and mind. And in fact, uh, some of the major names in psychology have delved into it in great detail. You know, I, I thought it was just Descartes then me that, you know, we were the only two people that ever thought about this. Lo and behold, who knew? Uh, just about everybody thinks about this, um, this sort of continuity or this interpenetrance between mind, brain and world. The contemporary version of this is what's called embodied cognition, which is a very prominent idea in both cognitive science and uh, philosophy of mind. Uh, and I encourage you to have a look at any of those authors and you'll find it uh, very uh, stimulating reading. But if you're an academic psychologi psychologist, it's not a good idea to spend your all, all your time reading books and, and thinking deep thoughts like that. It's a very good idea to try and find some data that speaks to it. And so the empirical approach that's relevant to this sort of complex understanding is complex system theory. And uh, we can start to think about complex system properties as quantified and explored through nonlinear dynamic analyses. So that's what we've done. And this is the third pathway and the final one we're going to talk about today.
So we're talking about complex system properties of the output of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Because, excitingly for me, it turns out that this little group of cells that is the heart of the circadian system also is known to play a very powerful role in complex system properties which we can observe, or sorry, we can uh, uh, determine from uh, high resolution time series data. The SCN is responsible for uh, various complex system properties of temporal fluctuations in locomotor, ac locomotor, locomotor, locomotor activity, it's been a long day, and uh, in other disciplines, cardiovascular activity. The particular uh, type of complex system property that the SCN is involved in is what's called scale invariant properties. And what do we mean by that? No, it's the notion of scale invariance is normally introduced in the spatial domain with this observation. If you look at the a map of a coastline and there are no man-made features on the map, you won't be able to determine what scale the map is at. And so, for example, this image here of the coastline of Wales, there are th three images, is actually the coastline at three different scales. On the left is one mile above the land, in the middle is 10 miles above, and on the right is 100 miles above. And what we're seeing there is scale invariance in the spatial domain. We see the same thing in trees and clouds. When you think about it, these complex shapes uh, do have this property. From whatever your distance you look at them, they kind of look like clouds or trees, depending on which one you're talking about. Uh, and in fact, biological systems generally exhibit scale invariance with parts showing statistically similar properties at many scales. That's in the spatial domain, but this gets important for health when we start to think about scale invariance in the temporal domain. And a guy called Ari Goldberger has driven a lot of this research in physiology, motivated primarily by trying to find hidden signals in heart rate data that might uh, predict cardiovascular events. And in fact, he and others have found that loss of temporal scale invariance in a biological signal can indicate disorder. And so we took this idea across to bipolar disorder. We predicted that decreased scale invariance, again using our favourite activity data, is an endophenotype of mania. And when I say we, I'm not smart enough to do the, the mathematics on this, but I am smart enough to know that I need to meet mathematicians. And so Indic Premananda is someone I met uh, in the corridors of uh, the Brigham, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in, in Boston. And he and I both share an interest in the importance of amplitude and robustness of uh, rhythms. Uh, but his understanding is much more sophisticated than, than mine. What he did was firstly to confirm, as, as we expected from the work of Hu and others, this scale invariance in our uh, actigraph data uh, using wavelet analysis. Wavelet analysis, the way I understand this, is looking for patterns in, in time series data at different scales it's analogous to procedures you might be familiar with where we're looking for sinusoidal patterns at different frequencies in time series data. But in wavelet analysis, we're looking for patterns of various types, not just sinusoids. So INDIC firstly confirmed this scale invariance feature in the data, which in itself was very exciting because it takes what looks like noise in the data to the eye and finds hidden signals, hidden information in it. Uh, and then he developed a quantification, an individual difference variable, which quantifies deviation from scale invariance, and we called that the vulnerability index. And we found, as expected, that uh, traits associated with BD were correlated with this vulnerability index. People with clinical bipolar disorder over on the right on that graph had higher uh, deviation from, from scale invariance than both high-risk people, controls, and also low-risk people. And the same 
finding occurred with uh, state measures of bipolar phenomena, where mania per se uh, was most strongly associated with the vulnerability index. Uh, so this, this is within bipolar disorder samples, what feature of the bipolar disorder phenomena is most strongly associated with this loss of scale invariance. And it's actually the defining uh, symptom of bipolar disorder, mania. So we concluded from this that decreased scale invariance, which is interesting because for us particularly because it's theoretically linked to abnormalities in the SCN control node, is associated with state and trait mania proneness. Now, the, so this is, uh, I think, an exciting use of the non-linear dynamic type analysis to throw light on uh, bipolar disorder with potential clinical impact from predictive algorithms, for example. But uh, once if we move into this uh, mathematical area, of course, we have to accept that there will be multiple models that can do this job. Uh, I myself have hooked up with a, another mathematician, a woman from Iraq, and we recently published an, another model using similar data which speaks about the uh, mathematical features of the data from the viewpoint of what's called a winless competition model, which starts to talk about uh, sliding into pathological attractors, which is another interesting and uh, nuanced way to think about uh, patterns of change in bipolar disorder. But as I say, the, the challenge with, with these approaches is their richness and that there are alternative models which need to be compared. So, to wind up, we think that uh, circadian function is multiply implicated in bipolar disorder, and there are a range, which we've introduced you to, to some of these today, of empirically supported, I hope you see, clinically relevant circadian explanations. And we, we also think that the elevation of activation itself as a cardinal symptom of hypermania is important because of its focus on the active observable organism in the environment and the use of actigraphy as a method for exploring that behaviour. We're particularly interested in neuroimaging as uh, raising novel questions about the prediction of reward activation. As you can see from this talk, we've um, focused primarily on behavioural measures and then gone to animal literature to draw inferences about what's going on in the brain's reward system. Obviously, we want to move into fMRI and uh, other neuroimaging methods to bridge that gap and speak directly about what's going on in, in, uh, neurally. And finally, we think that understanding the SCN as a control node uh, well, it, we, I think this is uh, self-evident, that that does in fact generate novel complex system questions about bipolar disorder, which turn out to be very rich uh, and, uh, and I hope fruitful. So that's it for today. I look forward to a face-to-face -face discussion of some of these things and, and your observations and, and related ideas you have that, that might contradict or, or support some of this stuff. I, I don't know how far you'll be travelling, but I'll be on a plane for just under a day. So I'll be very happy and relaxed to be on the ground and talking to you when we meet in North Carolina. Thanks for your attention.